Now we're going to learn how to study whether two different variables are related to each other using the chi-squared distribution and two-way tables. So again, here's the scenario. We're going to gather data. The data fits into categories, except now uh, each element of our sample fits into two different categories. And we want to know if they're related. So for example, I survey a whole bunch of college students. I ask them, two questions. One, what's your home state? And two, what's your favorite type of pet? Dog, cat, whatever. And then I want to see if there's a relationship. If people from one state favor dogs and another state favor fish and another state favor cats or something like that. Here's another example. Suppose I want to stu I'm studying tomato plants. I try out several different types of fertilizer, maybe three different types of fertilizer on a whole bunch of different plants. And for each plant, I count the number of tomatoes produced. So I put each plant into a different category based on the type of fertilizer used and the number of tomatoes it produced. I don't know if these are related to each other. I survey customers into my restaurant. I ask each question, uh, I category each uh, person as male or female and ask their favorite brand of soda. And then I can study where do males prefer certain brands uh, in comparison with females who prefer other brands. Is there some relationship there? I can then organize this data into a two-way table and use my chi-squared distribution to figure out if, uh, if whether or not there might be a relationship between these sorts of things. Let's work through a specific example. Suppose I survey college students and I ask each college student two questions. One, what year are you in college? And two, how many hours did you spend studying in this past week? I could ask them, uh, how many hours do you spend studying in a typical week? But we find that when we ask people to estimate things, well, they tend to be not quite as accurate. But if I ask them about this specific week, I'm more likely to get useful data. So suppose I survey 194 college students, and then I take the number of hours they spend studying, and I bin them into three different categories, less than, less than 15 hours in the last week, 15 to 30 hours in the last week, or more than 30 hours in the last week. And then here's a table with my numbers. So I've got every single single person I talk to fits into one of these 12 categories, four levels of freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and then three levels of the number of hours spent studying. And so everybody is in one of these. I add up all 12 of these categories and I will get a total of 194 college students. Notice that the observed values all must be whole numbers. Uh, in this case, our research question is, is there a relationship between student class standing and hours spent studying? It looks like, hmm, I guess based on this data, it looks a little bit like the seniors spend more hours studying than maybe the freshmen, or so maybe there's a relationship there. Or maybe this is just due to random variation. If the number of hours spent studying was the same freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, well, everybody who gathers a different sample is going to get slightly different results. And I just want to know, does this data fit within slightly? Or is this, is this significantly different than what I would expect if there was no relationship here? So my null hypothesis is there is no relationship whatsoever between class standing and the number of hours spent studying. In this case, any deviation from that uh, is just due to random variation and randomly gathering this particular sample of these 194 college students. And that if I'd gathered it, someone else went out and gathered a different sample, they just as likely to see the freshmen studying more than the seniors. So how in the world do I take this and turn it into a set of expected values? This is a little bit more intricate because I don't have any a priori. I don't start out with any assumption about what the distribution of percentage hours spent studying is or anything like that. That has to come out of the data. So what I do at a fundamental level is I reallocate the counts based on the assumption that the two variables are unrelated, based on the null. I say, okay, if the null was true, how would this be laid out? So what we do is we first compute the row sums and the column sums. So in this case, I have a total of 46 freshmen, 44 sophomores, 46 juniors, and 58 seniors. And I have a total of 32 students who spent less than 15 hours studying per week, uh, 90 who spent 15 to 30, and then 72 who spent over 30 hours studying. So I compute my row and my column sums. Then I can take these totals and divide them by 194 to get the proportions. In this case, we find that the proportion who spent less than 15 hours studying is 0.165. That's 32 divided by 194. So 16.5% of all students surveyed 
spent less than 15 hours studying. Uh, 90 divided by 194 gives me 0.464 or 46.4% who spent between 15 to 30 hours studying. And then 72 over 194 gives me 0.371 or 37.1% who spent over 30 hours studying. Again, to get those, I've totaled things up. Those 16.5%, 46.4%, 37.1% are all just based on the assumption that freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, it doesn't really matter. We just add them all up. So now, here's what I do. I got a total of 46 freshman students. If the null is true, then I would expect those to be allocated based on these proportions. I would expect 16.5% of them to study less than 15 hours, so I do 0.165 times 46 to get an expected value of 7.6. I would expect 7.6 to be the number of counts in my category of freshmen who spent less than 15 hours of 15 hours of 15 hours studying. I would expect 46.4% of the freshmen to study between 15 and 30 hours, so I don't point, so I do 0.464 times 46 to get 21.3 students. 21.3 freshman students studying between 15 and 30 hours, and 37.1% of those freshmen should study over 30 hours, so 0.371 times 46 is 17.1 freshman students studying over 30 hours. Those are my expected values for the freshman row. Notice that these are not whole numbers, and that's fine. Expected values don't need to be whole numbers. It's the observed values, which are actual real counts of my data, that must be whole numbers. Then I do the exact same thing with the others. I have 44 sophomore students, so I multiply those by the same proportions, the 0.165, the 0.464, the 0.371, and I get my expected values for the sophomores. I had exactly the same number of juniors as freshmen, so I get the same counts and the same expected values in the junior row. Uh, seniors, we had a total of 58 seniors, so 0.165 times the 58 seniors is 9.6. 0.464 times the 58 seniors is 26.9. 0.371 times the 58 seniors is 21.5. In each case, I take my row sums, the total number of freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors, and then I multiply those by the proportions in each of these three studying categories in order to get my expected values. That's the most intricate part of this process. Now, we do exactly what we did before. Every single count fits into one of these 12 bins, these three studying categories and four class level categories. And exactly like we did before, to get a chi-squared test statistic, we do observed minus expected squared divided by the expected. So we go through each of these 12s for the first category. We observed eight freshmen who studied less than 15 hours minus an expected of 7.6. So eight minus 7.6 squared divided by 7.6. And then we go through each of these 12 categories doing observed minus, expect, uh, minus expected squared divided by expected. We add them all up and we get 6.96. This can be done in R in a rather slick sort of way. So here were the, here were the commands that I would do in order to calculate this in R. Um, I want to create a data frame that has all this stuff in there. So I'm going to call this observed. So here's my observed equals data frame. My first category is below 15. So I create a vector of those numbers, 8, 10, 8, and 6. Those are the four freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, uh, who the counts we have who reported less than 15 hours studying. Then in the next category, 15 to 30, those numbers were 24, 22, 20, and 24. And then over 30, the numbers were 14, 12, 18, and 28. If we put this into R and then type observed, then we'll see it lays out the table. There's a wonderful command called row sums, and you got to capitalize the S in the middle. Row, capital S, you MS, and we do observed, and that computes our row sums. In that case, that tells me 46 freshmen, 44 sophomores, 46 juniors, 58 seniors. Call sums, again, S is capitalized, uh, gives me the column sums, 32, 90, and 72. Now I'm going to compute the proportions in each of these, these three categories. So that's call sums divided by 194. So there's the 0.165, the 0.464, and the 0.371. All right, this, uh, this allows me to compute things in an efficient way. I'm going to create another data frame, which is going to be, you know, the same dimensions, but this is where my expected is going to go. So here, I'll do this in a simple way. I'll say expected is going to be zero times the observed. So I'm going to have the same number of rows and columns with the same labels, but multiplying by zero just zeros everything out. Now watch this. I'm going to say expected, open square bracket, one, comma, close square bracket. 
I'm going to say everything in the first row, row one, comma, everything. I just leave that blank and so I get, uh, get all the columns. I'm going to say that's going to be my proportions, props, times 46. I had fresh 46 freshmen and so I'm reallocating those 46 freshmen according to those proportions. And then I do that for the other rows. Expected open square bracket two comma close square bracket. And then I fill that with proportions times 44. Expected open square bracket three comma close square bracket is proportions times 46. And then same deal for the seniors. And that way I can fill in each of these four rows with the same proportions times the total number of counts. Then check this out. One command, one simple command is going to add up all 12 pieces of my test statistic. I just type sum open parenthesis, and then I do observe minus expected in parenthesis squared divided by expected. And in one command, once since I've set up these two data frames carefully, one command now computes all of that all in one go, and I get 6.96, which is indeed my test statistic. All right, how do I get my p-value? Well, I'm going to get this from the chi-squared distribution again, but wait a minute. What's my degrees of freedom? Well, in this case, I'm using the data in the, the, the matrix in order to figure out what my expecteds are. And so as a result, my degrees of freedom will be the number of rows I have minus one times the number of columns I have minus one. I use the rows and the columns to figure out what these things are. So all my data points aren't independent of each other anymore. And so as a result, I have four, four minus one times three minus one, three times two, I have six degrees of freedom. So what is the probability of getting a chi-squared test statistic of 6.96 on six degrees of freedom? I go to my good friend R. Remember, whenever I'm using chi-squared, it's always a one-sided, one one-tailed, right-tailed test. I want to know the probability of getting this or bigger. So I do 1 minus PCHISQ of 6.96 comma 6, and I get 0.325, 32.5%. This is not terribly unlikely. This is larger than our tra tra traditional alpha, 0.05. Our p-value is larger than alpha, and so, yeah, we do not have a very unlikely result here. Our difference is not statistically significant. Just eyeballing those counts, it looked like maybe those seniors were working hard and harder than the freshmen. But in this case, the data is not strong enough to establish that. And so as a result, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This data, this data in particular, is not enough evidence to indicate that uh, hours of studying is related to class. Doesn't mean it isn't related to class. Maybe if I gathered up, did a bigger study, gathered more evidence, maybe I could establish that. But this data by itself doesn't establish any relationship between hours of studying and class standing. All right, quick summary. So sometimes each element in our sample fits into two different categories, and we want to know if the two categories are related. And in this case, we organize our counts into a two-way table where both the rows and the columns mean something. Our null hypothesis is that rows and columns are not related to each other in any way, shape, or form, and anything you see is just due to random variation in gathering this particular sample. If you gathered a different sample, you'd be just as likely to see the, 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 the freshmen studying more and the seniors left. So in order to uh, compute our expected, that's the tricky part, first we compute the row and column totals and proportions, and then we reallocate our counts based on the null hypothesis, the assumption that these variables are unrelated to each other. And uh, we compute a test statistic, just like we did before. Observe minus expected squared divided by expected. Add that up for each of the different categories. Then we use the chi-squared distribution to calculate our p-value. We evaluate, is this discrepancy uh, between observed and expected values, is this discrepancy really unlikely to occur by random chance, or is this the sort of thing that would happen all the time by random chance? And in this case, we got, eh, this would happen by random chance. This is not unusual by what we would expect from random chance. And so therefore, in this case, we concluded that uh, we did not have a statistically significant difference.